are now moving into this story with Candace Owens and Norm Finkelstein. So first and foremost, I want to say this. I don't agree with Candace Owens politically on pretty much almost anything. <laughs> pretty much almost anything. I agree with her in reference to the censorship issue, and I agree with her in reference to U.S. intervention. I don't think the U.S. government should intervene in other countries, get involved in these wars, et cetera, et cetera. Other than that, we don't really agree, right? But I will say this. If you have not seen this interview from Candace Owens with Norm Finkelstein, I think you need to watch this interview because I'm not going to play the full thing on here, obviously, but there's three parts I do want to highlight. Not only that, but I highly recommend that you look at the comment section of the video because the comments were wildly favorable towards this discussion. And I'm gonna say it like this. I honestly think, I feel that this was a chess move made by Candace Owens because Norm Finkelstein has been asking Ben Shapiro to debate him for I don't know how many weeks on Twitter, he's been challenging him to a debate about this issue with Israel and Gaza, and Ben has not been willing to accept the challenge. I wonder why. But Candace Owens was willing to sit down and have the discussion with Norm Finkelstein, so I feel like this is a chess move by Candace Owens towards Ben Shapiro since he wasn't willing to do it. Let's get into it. To first and foremost, unpack your bio a bit. I think it's great to have you here because you are an academic. And so people immediately kind of use the authoritative argument. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not educated about this. You are incredibly educated. And what brought you to, as a person who was raised by concentration camp survivors to the pro-Palestinian side? Well, I don't want to quibble over terminology but sometimes if the terminology is wrong <clears throat> at the outset, then it confuses things moving forward. I'm not pro-Palestinian. I'm not pro-Israeli. I'm pro-truth and I'm pro-justice. If the truth is on the Israeli side, I will support Israel. If justice is on the Israeli side, I'll support Israel. And the same thing goes for the Palestinians. I've spent the greater part of my adult life, you can say beginning 1982, so it's more than four decades, uh, researching, studying uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict. And it's my conclusion at the end of that research, but already early on, that the case that Israel makes for its crimes are in large part fabrications, misrepresentations, and distortions. And on the other hand, the Palestinian case is very strongly supported by the, the evidence. And when I speak about evidence, I'm not talking about what Hamas says. Any more than when I speak about Israel, I care much about what the government says. If you're serious about these sorts of things, first, the first thing you do is you try to search out sources which have a certain amount of credibility. So when it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict, let's say the human rights dimension, you look at what respected human rights organizations have to say, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty yep. International, the Beth Selim, the main Israeli informa information center for the occupied territories. And by the way, those organizations have been complaining about the human rights issue in Gaza for years. Uh, I think the first time I covered it was two years ago. Um, so yeah, just something to keep in mind. You look at what the evidence shows, not based on bias sources or naturally biased sources, uh, but on the available evidence. And I try to be a strict adherent of the two principles of truth and justice. And that's where I landed. And I think that's frankly where most of the world has landed. And it's also incidentally, but not trivially, it's where a large part of the young Jewish population has landed. If you go to the demonstrations now, the ones have garnered the headlines say the one in Grand Central Station, 
was overwhelmingly Jewish. It was all organized by Jewish organizations. That was the one that was organized by uh, Jewish Voices for a Peace. That one was huge, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm so glad that he said this on Candace's show because some of the rhetoric that's been coming from people like Megyn Kelly <laughs> and Ben Shapiro, if you just listen to them, and this is to anyone that's watching that's on the right, if you just listen to them, then it's like they will have you believing that the only people that are out there protesting for this issue or have organized the protest are people who are like Hamas lovers, people who are like domestic terrorists, et cetera, um, and, and leaving out this important part that a lot of the larger ones that have been organized have been organized by Jewish Voices for Peace. Young people, mostly, but not entirely. The Statue of Liberty demonstration, again, it was Jews, Jewish young people who organized the demonstration. So yep. this idea that it's somehow polarized ethnically is belied by the facts. Now, I will wholeheartedly admit that when I first started out, uh, we, were a, we were a handful of people, Jewish Jews, who opposed what Israel was doing. But the uh, spectrum has radically changed in recent years. I'm just one among a large number, a sea of Jews who oppose what's going on, not because they're self-hating, not because they're indifferent to the fate of Israelis, uh, but because the evidence is overwhelming. And you, it's impossible. You start out by saying you're not knowledgeable about the topic. Fair enough, there are 10,000 topics I'm not knowledgeable about and where you have much more knowledge. I'm quite certain of that. But this is not a particularly complicated situation right now. The Israeli government is openly, unabashedly, flagrantly, blatantly, it's a declared a war of genocide on the people of Gaza. I'm so glad again, like I know some people are like, oh, it's Candace Owens, who cares? You know, she's a grifter, yada, yada, whatever. Look, my thing is, is this, this gave someone on the left the opportunity to tell people what is happening in reference to the state of Israel and what they've been doing to the Palestinian people. But to explain this to an audience that for the most part, I would assume is predominantly right wing, right? Or conservative. So this could have been the first time that some of Candace's view viewers actually heard this perspective about it. She didn't interrupt him. Like I saw the entire interview. So she didn't interrupt him, cut him off. She wasn't nasty towards him. She just let him speak. And I sincerely hope, because like I said, I read the comments, the comments are in favor of the interview. I sincerely hope more people after seeing this interview, they will share it with their friends and with their family members who are on the right and may have had a different position about this issue. So they can hear it from someone like Norm Finkelstein, who is also Jewish, who knows a lot about this issue and has talked about this issue so much to the point that he has actually been, you know, barred from certain spaces because of it. That's not exaggerated language. The prime minister of Israel said in a speech which, been, which has been re, uh, reproduced everywhere, he said, this is a war against Amalek, referring to the Old Testament. And what's a war against Amalek? Well, just open up the Old Testament. Yep. It obliges Israel to kill every man, woman, and child. That's what it means to invoke a war against Amalek. Can there be any doubt? Now, I mean this seriously. Can there be any doubt in the minds of any objective observer when Israel declares a policy of prohibiting 
any food, water, fuel, or electricity from entering Gaza. If that's their declared policy. Now, I know that you're an expectant mother. Pause here for a second before he gets to the kids part. That piece that he brings up about the food and the water. So when we talk about this idea of the genocide or ethnic cleansing, it's not just in reference to Israel, you know, bombing Gaza. It's also in reference to them preventing food and water to come into the civilians. So let's say you are not killed by a bomb or airstrike. Then you could also die from lack of food or water. Remember, like 90% of the water in Gaza is not clean. So bear in mind what that means to you. Now, Ms. Owens, I'm not sure if you are aware that one half of the population of Gaza, its total population is 2.3 million, about 1.15 million are children. They're like the child that you have and the child that you are expecting. Now, some people will say, I'm playing on people's emotions. Mm -hmm. But I do not believe that you as a mother would be, would say it's manipulative, it's demagogic for me to say it is not a complicated question when a country has a declared policy of denying a population food, water, fuel, electricity. That is not complicated. So I won't even allow for the option of saying well, I'm ignorant. I don't know. Sorry. It doesn't require a lot of knowledge. Let's pause there and we're going to go to the second part. The part about the children, I think that's the part that really tugs at a lot of people's heartstrings. The video images that I've seen of the kids, uh, you know, people I know that are not even into politics, they've seen those images and they're like, this is awful. This is awful. Like, I don't see how anyone, unless you're a soulless bastard, I don't see how anyone can look at that and not feel something. And I feel that same way, by the way, when I showed the picture, when I talked about the pictures of the kids that were, be, that were starving in Afghanistan, when I covered that over a year ago because of the economic sanctions that were implemented by the U.S. government, same thing. I felt the same way. I feel the same way when I see those infomercials that pop on late at night and they said with $1 a month, you can help a starving kid in Africa. I feel the same way because a child is innocent. A child has, there's no guilt. It's a baby. And it, it is, it's, it's terrifying to me that people can see images of kids who aren't even old enough yet to know right and wrong and feel absolutely nothing, nothing. That is honestly disgusting to me. I, I don't understand how anyone can sleep with their self at night feeling that way. I do not understand it. Now we're gonna go to the second part here where he starts to talk about a little bit about what the audience may be uh, anticipating, where he breaks down this whole part about comp what's complicated and what's not complicated. Because I don't think it is a complicated situation. I think people are saying that because they don't really want to explain it and they don't want to admit Israel's faults. That's how I feel. The same way history teachers can sit down and explain World War II and World War I and migration, they can explain this. Let's get to this second part here. Was Hamas leadership 
Hamas's leadership in the basement of Al Shifa Hospital? Answer, no. Were there hostages beneath Al Shifa Hospital? Answer, no. no. You just get the lies and more lies and more lies and more lies and attendant upon those nonstop lies are the cessation, the termination of life because of the lies, the termination of life of thousands of Palestinian children. Is that complicated? Does it require a PhD in Middle East studies to figure these things out? In my book, at the risk of offending some people in the audience, and maybe that's why I react as I do when I see these things unfold before my eyes, it's as complicated as Jews like my parents' mother, mother on both sides, father on both sides, sisters and brothers on both sides. It's as complicated as my family, except for my mother and my father, being shoved into gas chambers. That's how complicated it is in my eyes. That mm. government in Israel, in cahoots with our own government, spread the lies about Hamas's command and control center to justify denying the fuel for the incubators. Now I'll tell you something, Candice. I live in an apartment building. I go into my elevator and there will be a parent with the kids. And I, I look at the kids and like an old man that I am, I say hello to the kids, you know, smile to the kids. And all of a sudden I get overcome with this sick feeling because I look at the kid and then I see those pictures from Gaza. Mm -hmm. I see those incubators with all due regard to your audience, sorry, not complicated. So I just want to say in defense of my audience, they are very receptive to conversation. I have built this platform talking about different sides. I mean, I take a lot of contrarian positions uh, and I think my audience, I'm constantly covering, you know, past CIA operations where the public was lied to. Um, I have, you know, critiqued even our own response and the killing of, you know, a million Iraqi civilians over perceived weapons of mass destruction that were never found. So I do just want to say that my audience is is not one way or the other. They're very open to conversation, just in defense of my audience. And uh, the second thing I want to say is that I didn't mention your academic credentials at the top of the audience because I at the top of the show because I felt that people needed to go. Oh well, he's allowed to say what he's allowed to say. I actually said that to push back against people saying that I wasn't educated and I wasn't allowed to ask questions. And so I'm saying, okay, well, he's educated, he's Jewish. Is he allowed to ask questions and present a different side? Just to let us skip skip through that process, not to say that. And I'll add in here too, I, I honestly get tired of the so-and-so is not educated enough or informed enough, you know, to talk about a topic. This is one of the things that those of us at RBN, like this is one of the reasons why RBN started is because we want people to realize there are different voices that need to be heard from, right? You don't have to have a PhD. I don't have a PhD. I have a master's, but I don't have a PhD. And there are a lot of people in the space that do not have uh, a PhD. Does that mean that they're not as informed, right? No, not necessarily. You can educate yourself in different ways. Doesn't mean you have to do so uh, in reference to different types of degrees. So that's one of the things I've said before is like, you know, to, to audience members that I guess may have had a problem with her not talking to someone about this that does not have, uh, I guess, a PhD or whatever, or her talking about it because she doesn't have a PhD. I'm just like, yeah, so what? <laughs> so what? 
you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes these things are more about lived experiences and not necessarily about what you researched in college. People require um, a degree to feel something. I mean, if you know anything about my story, I don't think that. And if you have followed my commentary, I am very struck by the lack of inhumanity that I am seeing um, from both sides. And uh, I mean, I don't understand how people can be so angry at Israelis that when you see a dead Israeli child, you don't feel something. And I do not understand why people need to, as I said yesterday on Tucker's program, button the issue of saying when you see a dead Palestinian child, oh, but it was a human shield. That's not my reaction. I had a very emotional reaction to seeing uh, a dead Palestinian Christian child pull from the rubble and it, she looked like my daughter and I cried. So I, I am not beyond my humanity here. I don't need a PhD to feel that humanity. And it is why I said that I wanted to make sure that both sides are being represented here. Now, what I do want to ask you is you talked about mowing the lawn. You said an Israeli government policy. It, what do you mean by an Israeli government policy? What, what specifically are you talking about? Because that is something that I am ignorant of. And I would just like you to explain where that comes from. Okay. Now I've been accused of going on and on and on and on. So <laughs> we'll have to at some point say, okay, you explained that enough. Let's move on. Um, <laughs> the basic picture is this. And I admit everybody has an arbitrary starting point. So people may not agree with my starting point. So let me just give you the very basic picture as I see it. In 2006, our government, it was then President Bush, it was in that period, you might recall, what was called democracy promotion. And one of the uh, instances of democracy moment, promotion was he told the Palestinians to hold an election in the West Bank and Gaza. They hold an election, Hamas wins the election. Okay? Hamas wasn't, didn't want to participate, ended up being convinced to participate, uh, put up a party, and it won the election. Jimmy Carter, who you know, because you're from the South, and former president, uh, he monitored the election, uh, and he said, completely honest and fair election. I'm quoting him word for word. Uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, she said later, the United States made a mistake because it didn't rig the election. That's what she said. The wrong party won. We made a mistake. We should have rigged the election. And that was just an example of Hillary Clinton, again, advocating for the U.S. intervention abroad, right? It's really not up to us to decide who other countries' leaders should be. Uh, that's not a fair democracy. Uh, and I really think the U.S. government needs to have their hands out of those matters. So I was glad that he mentioned that as well. Hamas comes to power. What's the first thing the United States does? What is the first thing Israel does? They impose sanctions on Gaza brutal economic sanctions. First of all, before I get to those sanctions and rush to the present, your audience has to know or should know and would probably want to know what is Gaza. Gaza is 25 miles long. For those in your audience who are joggers or runners, Gaza's long, its length is less than a marathon. Its width is five miles. And even in my old age, I jog five miles every day. It's not a long distance. Gaza is five miles by 27, 20, uh, 25 miles. So any of you that have been to the Boston Marathon, which I've gone to multiple times, it's that length, if you think about it. It's not that big. Okay. It's among the most densely populated places on God's earth, more populated than Tokyo. 70% of the people of Gaza, 70% are refugees. They were expelled from Israel in 1948, and they and their descendants ended up in Gaza. 50% are children. That's Gaza, yep. among the most densely populated places on God's earth a tiny parcel of land overwhelmingly composed of refugees and their descendants and children. That's Gaza. So a brutal blockade is imposed on Gaza in 2006. What does that, what does that blockade look like or what does it mean? 
It means nobody can go into Gaza and nobody can leave Gaza. Yep. With the rarest of exceptions. What do you what do you if mean you, by that? Sorry, and I'm I'm really sorry for being ignorant. You should so, ask. Yeah, you should so ask. Hamas Because people voted, don't understand that. Yeah, people, Hamas They're was right. voted into power in two thousand and six. Right. Um, right. by the it Gazans. Wins the parliamentary elections, yes, right. correct. So if they are the government, what do you mean that despite this, Gazans can't leave or enter well, that territory? Uh, See, this is the part I think that some people may not have been aware of, right? Like, I mean, this is something I know that uh, Gray Zone has talked about this a lot. Uh, Anya, well, Anya's part of the Gray Zone also. Uh, Gray Zone's talked about this a lot. Kim Iverson talked about this when she uh, came onto the show, and she's talked about this a lot on her show as well. This is the piece that I think a lot of people are just not aware of, that they do not have freedom of movement. So I think it's important that this piece is discussed as well. Uh uh, Candice, if you have the time, I appreciate the questions. Because if you don't know, then 95% of Americans don't know. That's right. And so we need to go through it. Israel controls the exit and the entry to Gaza. Israel controls the airspace. Yep. Israel controls the waterways. Israel controls everything. What goes in? There was a period when Israel denied chocolate, as in bonbons, couldn't, go, no, it's very serious, couldn't go into Gaza, wouldn't allow baby chicks to go into Gaza. It wouldn't allow potato chips to go into Gaza. There was a period when Israel had an explicit policy of giving Gazans, it was calculated, a starvation plus diet, a diet that just hovered above starvation. Yep. It controls everything. See, this is what people need to hear. People need to hear this. Like, imagine if that was happening to us in the United States, right? Imagine. In Gaza, there are people with severe medical conditions who want to go to better hospitals in, say, Jordan. They cannot leave. They cannot leave. Gaza is half the population, suffers what international humanitarian organiza organizations call, quote, severe food insecurity, which is to say half the population of Gaza never felt what it was like to have a full stomach. Now we talk about poverty in the United States and we talk about like, you know, starving kids in the United States and child hunger here in this country. And that is, that is real. That is a, a real issue, but I do just want to make a comparison for a bit. What's happening to those kids in Gaza and has been happening before October 7th. You want to talk about child poverty and child hunger. It is even more of a severe case in Gaza than it is in the United States. In the United States, at least we do have some type of programs where if you are, you know, a certain income, your parents are a certain income, then you do qualify for certain programs. Doesn't mean that you're getting a, a great lavish meal either, but it's more than what it, kids are given in Gaza. You can, they have no control. They can't even grow. This is another thing Miko Polid talked about. They can't grow their olive trees. They're not allowed to, it's just, just total control. You've been half to Gaza. The popula half the population of Gaza is unemployed. Among youth, it's 70%. Highest, uh, highest unemployment rate of any area in the world. Now, that's the facts, the discrete, the separate facts. Have What's you been to Gaza, thing? Norm? Yes, I've been to Gaza. Yeah, I think I read that in your bio. You spent some summers there. 
No, I spent summers in the West Bank. Okay, so not, not took, in Gaza, but in I the West Bank. I took two trips, two trips, I think, to Gaza. But you know, at my age, I can't even remember how many times I was there. But I think I was there two or three times. Yeah, three times. In any event, if you take all the facts together, what do you get? David Cameron, the former conservative prime minister of the UK, he described Gaza as an open air prison. Yep. One of the senior officials, I would like your audience to listen, planted in your mind. One of Israel's senior security officials, Giora Island, E-I-L-A-N-D, still a very prominent figure in Israeli security establishment. In 2004, before the blockade, he described Gaza as, quote, a huge concentration camp. And that's exactly what it looks like if you've seen pictures of it. Anya Prime, uh, Parampil actually uh, had a trip to Gaza. Uh, she covered this when she was a part of RT, and she was actually outside the gates and talking about what it was about. Like, it really does look like that. I want to get to this last piece of the interview here. The genocide. First and foremost, what would be the upside, if you were the Israeli government, to committing a genocide against the Palestinian people? I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Sure. It, it, you see people protesting all around. Why would you think this is something that you're going to get away with if that is, in fact, the goal with everybody watching? Okay. okay. If you allow me, there are two separate questions. The first question is whether it's a genocide. And as I said, at the risk of boring the audience, if you <laughs> buy food, water, electricity, and fuel, it's a genocide. That to me is a no brainer. However, there is the question that you just raised, the perfectly ra reasonable question. And the reasonable question is, why? Is it something in the Israeli DNA? No, I don't think so. Because Gaza for them, for Israel has always been a problem because they refuse, if I can put it this way, they refuse to just languish and die in a concentration camp. They refuse. Yep. And so periodically, you know the famous expression, wherever there's oppression, there's resistance. So periodically, there is resistance, and Israel mows the lawn. But after October 7th, it decided, number one, this was obviously a resistance of a much higher magnitude, what happened on October 7th. And also, it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity to solve the Gaza question. Yep. Now, during the first week, and we're not talking about ancient history now, we're talking about five weeks ago, six weeks ago. During the first week, they were hoping to expel all the Palestinians to Egypt and ethnic cleansing, just clean out Gaza. That was the goal. It didn't work because the head of state of Egypt says, no, <laughs> Gaza is your problem, not ours. You're not gonna put all these people in the Sinai desert and it's gonna become our problem. Yep. So that option was no longer available. With that option no longer available, how do you solve the Gaza question? You destroy Gaza, you make it, uninhabitable, you turn it into a howling wilderness, and you kill off as many people as you can get away with, given international public opinion, which always acts as a constraint. And there are different ways that they can do this. Again, like I mentioned before, the water is toxic. The majority of the water was, was uh, dirty before October 7th, but now it's even worse because there's all this waste that's backing up into the water. I've seen videos of those as well since October 7th. So that's another thing that people do have to understand. There are different ways that they can cleanse the area. One is to push the people into Egypt, which obviously did not happen. The second one is to 
make it so uninhabitable for you to live there that you're going to die from other things, illness, right? Disease, that type of thing. And it's interesting because when you think about like environmental pollution, purposeful environmental pollution in the United States, this reminds me of places of Flint, Michigan and uh, Jackson, Mississippi, where our government just basically was like, let's just give these people dirty water. And, you know, it's like, do you guys know that like, if you don't have clean water, you know what kind of diseases that can actually cause? Like, for example, cholera. Cholera actually resurfaced in Haiti because of this reason, not having clean water. So it can cause a catastrophe. So if they're not killed by the bombing, by the war, they can die from disease because Israel has found a way to make it so inhabitable. And you have to acknowledge that Israel has been quite successful. Do you know that more children have been killed in Gaza in the past five weeks or six weeks, more children have been killed than in every other war zone in the world combined in the years 2020, 2021, and 2022. Okay, so I had somebody, Dave Rubin, actually, when I, I just made the blanket statement that genocide is, any, any aspirations or dehumanizing talk is always wrong, again, in reference to Brian Mass' speech in Congress. She's going to get to the part about uh, Dave Rubin, but really quick, if you guys have not had a chance to do so, go ahead and smash that like button. Thank you. That helps me with the algo. If you're new, don't forget to like, sub, and share. Thank you. Let's get to the Dave Rubin part, and then we'll wrap there. Uh, and he pushed back on this, thinking that I was talking about the Israeli government. I wasn't, but he did share a chart in which he showed that, you know, since Israel has been its own sovereign nation, that the Palestinian population has grown. And I think his intent in sharing that was to say, well, if they were trying to commit a, a genocide, why would they allow the population to grow? So, and I, I don't have the exact numbers available to me. I'll try to splice this in after um, so people can see it. What do you say to that? Israel's policy, as I said, was it was a concentration camp, not unlike, for example, the Japanese during World War II. We called them mm -hmm. internment camps. It was a concentration camp. As I said, Israel had a policy of a very controlled diet, a starvation plus diet. However, we have to acknowledge something seriously different happened after October 7th in terms of the avowed Israeli intention. Up until October 7th, the Israeli intention was to just keep these people confined in the concentration camp and leave them there to languish and die. But after October 7th, if you look at the avowed aims, it's clear that now they believe that they have a pretext, or at least they be believed in October 7th. They now had a pretext and a opportunity because of the leeway given them by the European and American international community they now had a pretext and a opportunity and an opportunity to solve the question altogether. That's right. So guys, if you have not seen the full interview, please go do so uh, again. It is on Candace Owens uh, podcast. I believe this is also on Norm Finkelstein's channel as well. He does have a YouTube channel um, and it's called Israel versus uh, Palestine with Norm Finkelstein. Uh, very, very educational things said there. If you have not heard, 